All right, so next up, uh, we've got Cassandra, um, who is an MFA student, and she will be presenting her work, Z Network. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to our virtual space today. I'm super pleased to be here. My name is Cassandra Hadil, and today I want to talk a little bit about my work around libraries, oppression, and catalog interfaces. I also want to give you all a trigger warning that this talk briefly mentions the topic of sexual assault. So the Zine Network project is a radical interface that describes the holdings of the Barnard Zine Library, a collection of 5,300 zines with an emphasis on works by queer authors, women and non-binary authors, and authors of color. The Barnard Zine Library is cataloged by zine librarian Jenna Friedman, who I believe is here today. So hi, Jenna. Zines are texts that are largely self-published, self-printed, and self-assembled. They stand outside the traditional model of publishing, circulating instead in informal networks of friends, fairs, and art festivals. So here's an example of a really cool text in the Barnard Zine Library. This is Quarrel. Quarrel is subtitled as Stories of Survivor Self-Determination, Direct Action, Strategies for Safer Spaces, and Ripping Patriarchy to Shreds. So I want us to all just take a moment and think about what kinds of words, ideas, values, and communities you associate with this text, just based on what these pages look like. Now, here is how Quarrel is categorized using the Library of Congress's official subject headings. So the keywords that we have here are political activists, rape, direct action, and patriarchy. Okay sort of. This is maybe one way to describe what this text is, but it's definitely a pretty limited way. And this is a very typical example of what happens to a text like this when it's cataloged in a library system. It gets kind of flattened. Library metadata uses normative Eurocentric organization to categorize non-normative collections. The Library of Congress subject headings, which are exemplified here, are the standardized terms used to classify library holdings throughout most of the world. They are also notoriously conservative, heteronormative, and colonial in nature. K.R. Roberto, a queer activist, cataloger, and librarian, works specifically around the terms that are used to describe queer subjects in this system. Roberto tells us, instead of GLBT or LGBT people, Sexual minorities is the authorized form for these terms. Removing queerness from the catalog does not eliminate it. Rather, it creates a space that only values clearly delineated identities. No matter what the terminology says, queerness is still present in the catalog. Its explicit invisibility haunts LCSH. In the case of a collection like Barnard's, where many queer researchers go to find works by other queer people, this is a representation problem. There is a mismatch between how a user or reader sees himself and what they see reflected of themselves within the system. I want to nuance this critique a little. The catalog contains oppressive organization, but it also contains opportunities for resistance within its own data systems. Jenna Friedman uses a data field known as a local note field to describe the unique physical appearance and content of zines with content-rich summaries. These summaries, which become searchable in the catalog, are one way of achieving the discoverability that subject headings are supposed to provide without dealing with the ill-fitting and biased language of the standard Library of Congress headings. So here's a summary of Coral that lives in that field. I won't read the whole thing aloud because of time constraints, but I want to note that the description contains the phrases prison industrial complex and manarchist, both of which I am pretty sure the Library of Congress does not know and certainly would not use as subject headings even if they did. Jenna also uses another local note field to apply custom genres to the zines in the collection. These genres stem from the form of the zines themselves, and so are descriptive in a way that traditional metadata simply cannot be, because traditional metadata was not designed to hold materials like these. So if we actually go and look at the data, this is what we see, a beautiful, content-rich description, 
followed by those awful Library of Congress headings, followed by the custom zine genre fields. With this stark contrast, the data is telling a really compelling story about the contradictions of its own classification. Activist librarian and scholar Emily Drabinsky writes that applying a queer analysis to library data requires that we steer clear of correction of problematic subject headings or metadata and instead invite the user to grapple with it. She suggests that, quote, designing search interfaces that make related and broader terms visible to users so that they can understand how materials are linked in the knowledge organization scheme is one of many ways to reveal points in the classification structure through which the power might leak out, end quote. Drabinsky's approach of invitation and of showing, rather than merely correcting, is at the heart of this project. Visualizations, after all, are attempts to show. When we apply an organization system to a set of things, we are creating a landscape, a geography that tells us something about how to read the information. That begs the question, what are the features of the geographies that we are making? If we map out these systems with all their biases, oppressions, and normativity, what do they actually look like? And how can these maps help us navigate the fraught landscapes that has been created, in many cases, long before we even got here? In the zine network visualization, the zine genres shape the broad geography of the collection with colorful neighborhoods. Upon a closer look, boundaries are fluid, as most zines in the collection claim more than one category. Here, we have visual confirmation that not only is the personal political, but the personal zine is the political zine, which is also the art zine. The visual landscape that is created by zine genres is one that embraces the multiplicity and overlap of its inhabitants' categories, a far cry from the space of the catalog that values only clearly delineated identities, as Roberto has told us. In this visualization, Friedman's custom genre fields ensure that the contours of the landscape are formed by data that is specific to zines and respectful of the ethos of the collection. However, it is also important to imagine visualizations that are based on the other data that hold this collection. That includes the Library of Congress subject headings. Visualizing how these subject headings shape the collection is part of the process of inviting the user to grapple with them, per Drabinsky. The landscape of the Barnard Zine Library's holdings and classification system is complex. It is a geography that contains some wonderful classification, thanks to Jenna, and some deeply problematic classification, thanks to the Library of Congress. My hope is that some good maps of this landscape will help researchers and students who use the library see both. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cassandra, for your amazing work. Uh, all right, so next up, we're gonna have John come back on. After all, this wouldn't be a, a DT event without a tech glitch, so <laughs> go ahead, John. Thanks, Allison. Before we get started, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, my thesis professor, Richard Tay, um, introduced me to Mimi's work um, in my first couple of weeks at DT, um, and she's did it with the pursuit of turning personal data, the stuff that we create passively through everyday activity like browsing the web or commuting to work into a form that highlights it as a material and makes it accessible, makes it tangible, uh, in some cases maybe makes it useful and maybe even meaningful for the people whose data that, whose stories that this data tells. And the impetus for this inquiry is really twofold, twofold. Uh, on one hand, I'm amazed at this material, how much we can learn about ourselves and our communities from it, um, what things we can make out of it. Um, and I consider this a pursuit uh, worthy, a worthy end in itself. But uh, by engaging deeply in this data, it's really impossible to ignore the more critical questions of ownership and agency, like why is this data being collected in the first place? What systems enable this type of collection? Who stands to benefit? And do I, as an individual, have a say in this story that gets assembled from this data? Think again about the photo analogy. 
So last year, I learned about Google Takeout, um, and that's a service that allows users to download copies of the data of theirs being stored on Google servers, like email correspondences, browser histories, location, all the data that it's worth noting is recorded by default. So I requested some data and I downloaded it. And the file that stood out to me was called myactivity.json. And it contained 80,000 search queries that I've typed in the last 10 years of my life. And this felt like stumbling on an old journal, but this journal is one that I actually stuck to and I've been consistent with it. And I've been logging it daily without uh, without knowing for a really good portion of my life. And as I waded through this file in my text editor before I really learned how to parse it with, with JavaScript, I was shocked at how intimate, often embarrassing, sometimes poetic this text was. It was a window into some of the most intimate details of my life. And yet it was in a form that's meant to be read by a machine, not read by people. So needless to say, I got hooked on this data set. And for the last several months, I've been designing and building tools for parsing, processing, and presenting my Google search history in different ways. Uh, so I'm going to show a couple examples of the outputs that I created. So my goal here is to give the data a form that makes it feel more like a personal archive than a data set and a form that allows me to engage with it, engage in, in the work and the joy of sorting, sharing, organizing, making sense of, and filling the gaps in of th this document, um, which otherwise we don't get to do. And from there, after I got sick of basking in my own memories, I wanted to make this experience accessible to others. So a selection of the tools that I built are now available at searchrecord.net. And it's, it's easy to engage with this tool um, and the artifacts that I've made and have this feeling of kind of delight. And these are really playful things that I've built here and lighthearted, and that's intentional. Um, I want this project to be approachable. And then there's this feeling that maybe creeps up a little later. What else, what else is out there about me? What is this being used for? And I found in working in this space that the hardest thing to respond to when talking about data privacy is this argument of, I have nothing to hide, why should I be concerned? And the people that write and theorize and teach about data think that's crazy. But that's not crazy because the term data is cold and distant, yet what it contains is anything but that. And I think that if we start to think about personal data as something small, something truly personal, maybe these high level concerns become a little bit easier to grasp. And in the meantime, we can use these documents for our own good. Thank you to everybody that helped me with this project. Uh, there's more than I can list here. Um, but I am excited to continue uh, building this. And thank you all for listening. Thanks so much, John. Congratulations. All right, next up, we've got Lon, who is an MFA student as well. Hi, everyone. This is Lon. Cool. So is everyone able to see my screen? I assume yes. Um, my year-long thesis research is around the topic, topic of computational comedy. Um, which stands for using procedural methods to create, um, produce comic text from borrowed resources. And the kind of the final manifestation of this research is this application, like this web interface, where you will actually be able to write with um, these different virtual um, stand-up comedians of your choice. You can write with them, they will complete your sentences, and hopefully throughout the process you get to explore 
different condensed themes and identities embedded in these materials. So before we actually, I actually walk you guys through the whole process, just a little introduction of what I mean when I say hack comedy. So for most of them that you know, typically hack is like, you know, the computer hackers, the network hackers. But um, for those that don't know, hack is also a term that's widely used in the comedy landscape when they're trying to refer to jokes that are considered obvious, that are copied from other authors or from people that are um, just always using all the people's materials. So that's exactly kind of what I'm doing here um, at the intersection of both programming and comedy. And speaking of why I am, I explore kind of this direction in the first place. English was not my um, first language and I struggled to feel culturally competent. So I was really trying to kind of use this way of programming um, and computational creativity to kind of reach or hack into that like landscape of American humor pedestal. Um, however, I didn't become a comedian. So this kind of whole process actually kind of um, absurdity in itself. Um, it also kind of reinforced the failure of my ideal pursuit. I almost went to take improv class, but I'm kind of glad I didn't. Um, okay, so going back to the interface, it's pretty straightforward. You kind of have like a three steps over here with the first one, you get to select any of the comedians. If I click open three of them, then these three individual modules that have these comedians name will show up, will pop up. And you have these three modes available for you to pick to interact with these different modules. The default mode is writing mode, which pretty much means if you go into this text box and you start typing just part of the sentences, Aziz and Sari module in this case will complete writing your sentences with word and references that are from um, Aziz and Sari's resources. Um, so if you wonder what those sources are, you can click show source and it's going to list all these um, transcripts that I scraped from the internet that I built these modules with. And these modules are Ngram Markov chain model based. Um, so it's a statistic mathematic models that kind of predicts um, how specific events, how likely one event has happened, would happen after the other event. So yeah, with these individual different um, modules, you can type anything and it's going to use the words and references from the source, as I said before. But if you type in like gibberish, for example, it's automatically kind of end your sentence with a period because there's no direct reference or way for it to grab any words to complete the sentences. So yeah, that's the writing mode and you can clear all the input individually or you can go straight to the next mode, which I call it group improv and just hit clear all output. So what is group improv? The biggest difference from this mode and write mode is you can type in one user input and you can have all these modules to kind of output um, contents at the same time. So you can really be able to compare with one prompt or one specific theme that you want to explore. You can see what words are being used by different comedians just having them side by side. And that's usually hard to do if you're just putting in their videos together. So that's the group improv mode. And with ranting mode, it's you pretty much going to close the show source over here. You type in the amount of words you want all the current selected comedian modules to rant for. Let's say I chose 50 words. Once you hit start, they're just going to start ranting on its own. Um, it's going to come out much more random. Um, and ridiculous because the algorithm over here is slightly adjusted. So the next predictable word is only um, using the previous word as reference rather than a whole sentence. So part of this application, which is writing mode, was used as a um, tool for performance that I delivered in March at La Mama Experimental Theater, um, where I actually had human actors to kind of verbally perform in, uh, perform out the generated output with a matlab style skeletons. And for tonight, two of them are actually joining us and we're gonna do a little, little demo. Um, so let's welcome Caleb and Xiao. If you guys can unmute yourself and turn your camera and just say hi so I know you're there. Hey. 
Can you hear me? Howdy. Oh, cool. So we have Caleb and Michelle. Um, so for the March performance, we actually had a whole flushed out three different types of writing, um, Matlib style skeletons, and we had um, the actors to kind of perform these outputs differently based on the style of the corpus. But for today, we're just gonna have each of them pick a comedian. And I'm just going to use kind of part of the whole skeleton that we used just to do a little demo and to entertain everyone a little bit. Okay, cool. Let me know who you want to pick, Caleb and Shell. Uh, I'll go with Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. Bill Moore, please. Bill Moore. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And the corpus we're going to do is um, Genesis 1. Want to love in the beginning from the Bible. It's going to be really weird, so bear with us. In the beginning, God created the real shit, and the baby are looking at each other. And the earth was born white and privileged. Yeah. Yeah, Shai, you need to be a little closer to your mic. It's a little hard to hear your voice. And oh. the earth was born white and privileged, and darkness was upon. Because we don't have an output for that. And the spirit of God moved upon the blinds. And God said, let there be able to. And there was about to be that guy until my best friend, Harry, showed up in my house with his two-year-old baby. And God saw the signs, emotions, feelings, all over the goddamn place, that it was real. Because when we start going down, this lady, she was like, he got my baby. And God divided the fuck up from the right and smacked her head on the glass on the left-hand side. And God called the best brain and everything. You take on is an incredible success. You won the trade war. You built the wall. You effortlessly solved the Middle East. And Stormy Daniels is still ba is still basking in the afterglow of your incredibly lovely. And the darkness he owned and mourners are being asked in lieu of flowers to just leave their car engine running. And the evening, the morning, and the morning were the only group that has a bias against themselves. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Love money. We hate you. <laughs> this short time, we're going to stop there. Um, but thank you so much, Shell. Thank you so much, Caleb, for entertaining us and bringing your amazing performance out here. Um, <laughs> and yeah. That's going to be a wrap Thank for you. this interface. Um, go ahead and try it out and explore this interface with all these different virtual comedians on your own. Thank you so much. Oh, you got, you can find it at www.hackcomedy.net. Yay, peace. <laughs> Thanks, Lon. Such a cool project. Um, next up, we've got Shirley, who's an MFA student, uh, and her project is titled Alternative Realities, Protect Me From What I Want. Hi, my name is Shirley Long and I am a MFA DT student. I'm going to start off by showing a 360 clip of my video narrative. So I've been thinking a lot about this and I've always been curious about this idea of happiness. How would you want to become happy? 
How would you achieve happiness? So I've always been curious about this idea of happiness. I think that it can be a sign of weakness to have a zipper on, but I think also a sign of strength. I think a zipper on is a bad sign. I think a bad sign is, it would be nice to be able to wear glasses and things that show emotion in, but I think that emotion can be a vehicle to allow you to be who you are and show emotion in a way that, I don't think we can see that in a world where humans are supposed to be, you know, very persistent, very outgoing, and I think that, I also think that, you know, this is a western idea of happiness and it's always been a western idea of happiness. And in many ways, Asian American there, middle class to lower middle class. I think that there's more to it than ethnicity. I think that there's a lot to it I'm thinking about, it actually does make. So that's a clip of just one of the narratives. Um, if you can't tell by the computer voiceover, these narratives are actually algorithmically generated. What I did was I had interviewed um, three Asian American women, myself being one of them, and I asked all of us to project what type of idealized future that we kind of expect for ourselves from a variety of different scenarios best case scenario, worst case scenario, etc. And I took the transcript from all of these interviews and I had fine-tuned a natural language processing algorithm. I used OpenAI's GPT-2 um, and used it to generate different segments of alternative realities for these individuals. Then I took these generated alternative realities and turned it into this 360 audiovisual experience. Alternative realities, protect me from what I want, is a physical installation and an immersive narrative experience. It really is a conversation between me, the artist, and participants about generative narratives around race, identity, and privilege in the Asian American community. I'm interested in interrogating our relationship with technology by using computer prediction as a way to control our own future. When I think about decision-making, we, at least I tend to make choices based off of this vision that I want for myself in the future. And the more I think about it, the more that I realize that so much of these choices are actually constrained by society and there's this unique relationship between ancestral migration and constraints and choices in technology. And I'm kind of interested in exploring this dynamic because I think that there's a lot to be said about the powers of control. What I was initially proposing is a interactive room installation where there are scrolls hanging from the ceiling, where each of the scrolls represent generative alternative realities for a specific individual and one of these rules would feed into a black box where visitors can put on a VR headset inside the black box to experience the audio visual experience of four of these narratives. The experience is meant to evoke a feeling of gazing into someone's stream of consciousness. I selected these narratives and its accompanying scenes as a way to visualize what these alternative realities in the multiverse could look like, and it's important to me that it looked realistic. Currently, because of the global pandemic, I've migrated from a physical installation into a digital installation of the work. This project began as a attempt to control my own future using technology, but it is also transformed into this speculative, existential, and critical piece about the pervasive power and limitations of technology. Great. Thanks so much, Shirley, for exploring these ideas and for sharing your work with us tonight. Uh, next up is June, who's an MFA student. June, go for it. Hi, everyone. Um, all right, can you all hear me? Okay, I'm gonna assume, yes. 
Um, hi, my name is June, and I'll be presenting uh, my project, A post work Renter's Paradise, which is an audiovisual essay about a post work future where productive labor has been fully automated and the only work left for humans to perform is reproductive. Um, so I'll first screen the film and then attempt to briefly summarize um, 18 months of research that um, informs the project. Before history reset itself, there was work, then there was reproduction. People were once a natural resource, like fish. Our creation and recreation were valueless, an externality. Labor replaced labor, replaced labor, until it couldn't. Full automation and a renter's paradise are fueled by a surplus of data. Privacy is exchanged for freedom. Productivity is for robots. Motherhood, womanhood, and housewife are not biological systems. They are ideology. <coughs> Within the renter's paradise, reproductive labor is collectivized. The family is extinct. We belong to a new era of relationships based on reciprocity. Children belong to themselves. The work now left for humans to perform is solely reproductive. The work is to reproduce. To work is to care. To work is to gestate. To work is to fix. To work is to maintain. To work is to rebuild. Work we are the creators of each other. We exist as surrogates in collective substitution. Within the renter's paradise, we reproduce and are reproduced. Everyone is a surrogate. So at its core, um, this project is a critique of the asymmetrical relationship between productive labor and reproductive labor. Um, reproductive labor involves all the work which produces and cares for individuals and maintains social and physical infrastructures. Um, the care crisis that we experience today and all of its complexities and contradictions has roots in this asymmetry. Um, the production and caring of people do not produce profit, therefore this type of work is devalued. 
um, despite the actual increase in demand for um, people to perform this um, type of work, its wages remain um, sta stagnant and its workers live in social and economic um, precarity. The narrative of the film is based on a series of provocations that provide glimpses of this post-work society. To, to work is to reproduce, productivity is for robots, children belong to themselves, and everyone is a surrogate. When I began this project in the fall of 2018, I was um, initially inspired by the work of uh, Marxist feminists and the Wages for Housework movements, which demand a recognition for the unpaid work that is involved in reproducing labor power. But during the thesis process, I focused my research on more contemporary sources which discuss reproductive labor as an intersectional issue. Um, while the work of early Marxist feminists told um, important stories, it, it essentially suggests that all women, regardless of um, class and race, are defined by their private domestic responsibilities and neglect the voices of immigrant women, poor women, and women of color and men um, who have been engaged in wage, reproduct re wage reproductive work for centuries and um, remain marginalized to this day. Informed by these ideas, um, a, renters, a post work renter's paradise speculates on what the future of reproductive labor looks like if productive, lab if productive labor were out of the equation. In a post work renter's paradise, to work is re to reproduce. The idea behind the concept of a renter's paradise um, comes from Peter Fraze's discussion of post capitalist futures in his book, Four Futures. Fraze defines rentism as a society determined by abundance and hierarchy. The ruling class consists of an elite group of people who own and control information and the reproduction of patterns. Um, rentism is essentially uh, an extension of surveillance capitalism with corporate giants like Amazon, Google, and um, Facebook accumulating immense wealth through the extraction of data. Within the renter's paradise, the renters live rent-free lives in exchange for the reproduction of their data. Um, like the replacement of agricultural labor with industrial labor, product Productive labor is replaced um, by reproduction. Um, in a post-work renter's paradise, productivity is for robots. Reflecting Marxist critiques of the family structure and inspired by non-biological forms of kinship, this world exists without the institution of the family as we know it today, which has been a source of oppression for many women. Um, in a post-work renter's paradise, reproductive labor is collectivized and children belong to themselves. In Full Surrogacy Now, Sophie Lewis argues that we must not side with the anti-surrogacy movement, which further jeopardizes the security and dignity of surrogate mothers. Rather, we must work towards, quote, the dream of surrogates running surrogacy, end quote, subverting the very meaning of the word surrogate to be a relationship based on collectivity and horizontality, not on subjugation. Um, for me, a clear answer to that is that everyone becomes a surrogate. In a post-work renter's paradise, everyone is a surrogate. So this project sits in the gray area between reality and unreality. Um, the purpose of the aesthetic and conceptual choices is not to be didactic or representational, but expressive, ambiguous, and gestural. The provocative statements and imagery are not to, intended to provide answers to solving the care crisis, nor are they dystopian or utopian visions of what I think a post-work future may look like. Rather, they are thresholds for viewers to enter and a lens through which one can question the ideologies and the underlying forces that we take as fact and view this form of work as work that makes the conditions of human existence possible. Um, so I wanna give a special thank you to Aneshka, Richard, Anna, Fiona, Tony, Shin, Melanie, and Spence for, for supporting me throughout this whole process. And last but not least, uh, my husband, Tristan Lapointe, who is always performing the reproductive work of making this thesis possible. Thank you. Thanks, June. Thanks so much, June. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we've got Eliza, who's an MFA student, and she'll be sharing her project titled Tactility and Care. Hi, I'm Elisa. Welcome to my talk called Tactility and Care. My thesis project uncovers and reimagines the materiality of technological devices focusing on manual care. How is the world within the technological object and how is the technological object within the world? My project started by me questioning the material culture that is produced by technological devices and the everyday interactions that we have with them. And I started experimenting the materiality of smartphone and exploring the nuances of the interactions afforded in different materials. 
So this is just a glimpse into the very early work that I did to start my project. Technological objects today are typically all screen-based and cuboid-shaped. We repeatedly swipe, hold, tilt, press, and tap screens embedded in sleek cuboids, consuming masses of information. And so we are engaged in this bodily performance that we're not entirely aware of. My technological coming of age consisted of a jumble of wires and plugs and chunky devices. I was always drawn towards the mechanisms of these objects, buttons, levers, switches, any physical parts to tinker with. The interactions I had with these parts usually had a visible causality to them that gave me some understanding of what was happening. But now all these interactions have condensed into clicking and tapping smooth surfaces, soon to disappear to be replaced solely by voice. Donna Haraway talks about cyborgs as hybrid of machine and organism, a creature of social reality. The metaphor of the cyborg portrays the body as an inescapable component of our lived experience with technology. But now, with each new advancement, more of the body disappears from the interactions we have with devices, from the body to hand to finger to being absent from the picture completely. This produces an aesthetic that detaches us from the materials and the objects themselves, since they have no texture or irregularities and they appear to effortlessly exist, seemingly without labor and infrastructure. We have high expectations from each click and tap. It is expected to always work. If it ever hesitates, pauses, or breaks down, you click and tap repeatedly, frustrated that it failed you in these technologically advanced times. There's nothing you can fiddle with and care for materially anymore as a user, except for maybe rebooting the device and hoping it works. Technology has advanced a lot since the days of me banging a CPU to get it to stop making that weird noise. Now our technological connections are getting stronger, but our connection to materials is broken. Cyberpunk and body horror films have an intriguing contrast to present-day sleek and smooth devices. They frequently show technologies as having flesh-like organic and strained surfaces with fissures and oddities. They are hybrids of human and machine, not unlike Donna Haraway's cyborgs. She says about technological objects, and I quote, Made of sunshine, they are all light and clean because they are nothing but signals, electromagnetic waves, a section of a spectrum. People are nowhere near so fluid, being both material and opaque. If people are not fluid and require friction, texture, and movement, then why do our devices aim to produce a material culture that is sterile, seamless, and inert, removed from the realm of the physical? Focusing on the emotional and material nuances of interaction brings us closer to the hardware of a technological object. The way your fingers navigate the grooves of an audio jack as it audibly plugs into place, it gives you an embodied sense of how parts connect to let signals flow. This tactile causality is what keeps us engaged with the material, and being engaged with the material is the first step of making visible these infrastructures that we never really think about. From the materials that are extracted and the human labor required to do so, to the electricity that is produced and delivered, to the server farm that is maintained and the data that is processed, and to the delivery person at your door. This project is one way of questioning and reimagining this techno-material landscape in hopes of fostering a greater sense of care and responsibility towards the materials we use and interact with. It does so through a series of technological artifacts that are shown through a short film titled An Incomplete Glossary of Technological Interactions. Now this three minute film is going to play and I would advise you to listen to it through earphones or headphones for a richer sound experience.
That was a portion of the film. These are the complete contents of the incomplete glossary. And if you're interested to watch the extended version with chapter 3 as well, called Domestic Rocks, you can find my project on our website at parsons.edu. Thanks, Eliza, for sharing your work. Uh, and last but not least for our second session, uh, we've got Elena, who is an MFA student, and their project is titled Queering Our Interface. Hi. Thank you so much for coming to the MFA Design and Technology thesis live stream event. I'm so excited to share my work with you. My name is Elena Lee Gold, and my thesis is entitled Querying Our Interface. My work examines the inherent hetero and gender normative foundation that our computers, and more specifically, our internet's interface is built on. This work focuses specifically on interface because it's the first line of interaction with our computers. Our interface often draws on metaphors that reinforce normativity. One superficial example is the metaphors that align neatly with office work of white collar employees, such as files, folders, desktop. These emphasize that the computer was originally used as a tool solely for labor. And though our computers have new varied uses, this metaphor still prevails. Because interface is so heavily guided by the norms of the world it was built in, it brings our society's values into its functionality and therefore into our digital world. More concretely, this might look like a non-binary person being asked to choose male or female to register for a site. But the conventional male slash female dropdown interface isn't just an oversight, it's a profit calculation. A study by Bivens and Heyman in 2016 revealed that the classification of a person registering for a site as male or female allows advertisers to continue to market based upon what they believe that user might buy. Non-binary as a variable, on the other hand, doesn't have the arsenal of research data, and case studies that reinforce what people in this category might purchase, or at least not yet. These sorts of examples are prevalent on the internet, but they point to a deeper logic of capitalism. This logic is fundamentally opposed to the values of queerness. It prioritizes the gaining of capital over being and searching for the truest version of oneself. My work specifically addresses the manifestation of gender and heteronormativity in the human-computer relationship. While interface demonstrates our cultural norms through metaphor so well, it's also the primary set of interaction between humans and computers. I argue that the human-computer relationship that Americans view as normal is analogous to heteronormativity. Though heteronormativity is less rigid than it once was, it still features a set of relatively strict ideals that as a society we apply to our relationships, like the presence of hierarchical power dynamics, patriarchal values, or utility. Our human-computer relationships also feature a set of strict guidelines. The human user gives a command, and the computer is expected to dutifully respond. The relationship that we form with our computers is born out of utility. We need them to perform for us as efficiently and effectively as possible. Ultimately, humans are in the dominant position and we expect our computers to be submissive. Heteronormativity reinforces that within a relationship, there are strict roles that one must occupy. By querying these roles, I'm interested in creating human-computer relationships that allow both the human and the computer to transcend, switch, experiment, play, and do away with these roles. The relationships that I'm interested in cultivating instead are born out of unconditional love, subvert a hierarchical power dynamic, and are non-transactional and work to establish mutual caretaking. In order to achieve this, I've built four Google Chrome extensions that attempt to manipulate interfaces across the web in order to cultivate these qualities in a human-computer relationship. My first prototype was prompted by the question, how might close buttons express connection? On a human scale, the act of saying goodbye or seeking closure carries a lot of weight. Closing in digital space can feel capricious and inconsequential. Often it's reversible. But are there implications for how this feature might translate over to our physical lives? The extension works like this. When a browser window is closed, the browser delivers its human counterpart a message containing their last memory in URL form, a brief thank you for the birth and death of this particular window, and signs off with a numerical identifier. How might creating a mindfulness surrounding the relationships we so easily create and terminate with our browser windows instead cultivate care and intention around their summoning? The second prototype addresses the question, how might icons express a bedtime ritual? 
Digital caretaking for our computers is often in service of performance rather than growth or happiness. Human to living entity caretaking does not translate over to the digital world in part because of the lack of infrastructure encouraging it. This work allows a computer's human counterpart at the end of their browsing session to methodically take icons representing sites they browse that day and put them in their virtual bed. When all icons have been put to bed, the screen turns black and the browser closes. How might our relationship to our computers change if we were in charge of gently waking it up every morning or putting it to sleep? The third addresses the question, how might hyperlinks express shyness? This work centers on the caretaking of hyperlinks who behave as if they hold the human trait of shyness. The human interacting must move their cursor incredibly slowly to interact with hyperlinks they come across while browsing. Otherwise, fast cursor movements cause hyperlinks to temporarily shed their click-through ability and shrink down to an incredibly small size. Once the cursor movement slows, the hyperlinks grow back to their original size and regain click-through abilities. The element of trust is crucial in this work. In order to ask a hyperlink to carry a human from one site to another, in this case, one must earn the trust of the hyperlink and spend the time it takes to understand their sensitivities. How might taking the time to understand these hyperlinks extend to how we view the traits of other interface elements? Might our browsing habits change to accommodate these traits? And lastly, how might touchscreens express warmth? A warm device often means that the processor is hard at work and the device is generating heat. While warmth might be generated physically by the machine, how might we as humans both appreciate this warmth as evidence of hard work on the part of the computer and also show warmth in return? This work permits one's browser to redirect at randomly timed intervals to a black screen. Text on the screen encourages those browsing to seek out the warm spots with their fingers, taking a moment to appreciate their computer's labor. This work begins to envision a world in which one's computer asks for physical connection during a particularly strenuous time, as one might do with a romantic partner or friend. How might the role of communication between digital and physical realms and asking for what one wants change the way we expect our computers to behave? My intention for this work is to push for a shift in our digital space that's simultaneously intimate and jarring, speaking to the queer experience. There's intimacy in understanding oneself, knowing one's community, and allowing oneself to exist outside of traditional norms. But that also wars with the oppressive nature of coming face to face with these very norms. To those who don't experience this kind of digital resistance to their identity, they may feel that interacting with this work renders their computers foreign and unnavigable. For people who might have similar experiences, our online spaces may have felt this way for a really long time. My hope is that these extensions dislodge the stilted, rote nature of our interface and provide an element of agency to reimagine the constraining nature of these interfaces. Just as queer theory might illuminate queerness in a very binary and heteronormative world, my hope is that applying the same framework to the digital spaces that are similarly binary can help release us from the grip of these rigid digital structures. Thank you. Thanks so much to Elena. Um, so now we're gonna kick off the last Q&A session of the evening. Um, so the students will be participating are John, Cassandra, Lon, Shirley, and June. Um, so Mimi Onuoha is here joining us tonight um, and she'll be kicking off the Q&A. Uh, Mimi is a Nigerian American artist and researcher whose work highlights the social relationships and power dynamics behind data collection. Her multimedia practice uses print, code, installation, and video to call attention to the ways in which those in the margins are differently abstracted, represented, and missed by socio-technical systems. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, everybody who presented. This is this is great. I just want to take a minute to acknowledge that all of y'all were working in such challenging circumstances, and you produced such polished and interesting work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here to talk with each of you. And we don't have enough time. I would like to ask each of you about five different questions. Unfortunately, I can't. So I'm going to try to jump in. But just know that I'm asking you one question. And there's like so many more after that, that if we had more time, would go into. So start with Cassandra, because Cassandra went first. Cassandra, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Hey, thank you so much. I just... Of course, like your, the project that you did has a real soft spot to me because I love zines, organized my own zine fairs, 
And I think there's so much important work that they do. I also just loved how you took issue with the systems of cataloging and taxonomies themselves. Really, really important thing that you did. I appreciate that. And I think Jenna's doing great work. So just everything about this, I was really excited, really excited to see. And you, I think you did such a great job. Um, my question for you is this. So as you know, zines are often, they're DIY. They, they usually are spread by hand, word of mouth. There's this informality to them that is really built into the app, built into them. And it's, it's so important. And I know that for communities that I'm a part of, often that informality has led to a sort of closeness that can form as a kind of protection. That, and it's that protection is often, it's necessary because of the particular groups uh, that the zines are usually, you know, they're aiding. They're really meant to be against these kind of dominant narratives. And I wonder how you reconcile this. You've made this gorgeous visualization. It's doing so much important work. And yet it also is doing this work of making something a little bit more open and opening it out to flattening the audience of who gets to engage with it. So how do you think about that? Or how, how have you thought about that in making this project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, thank you so much for that question. That obviously is something that comes up a lot in this kind of work. And you always have the sort of like, early on sort of almost identity crisis of like, oh my God, should I even make this thing? Like, is it even ethical for me to be making this? Is this even the right direction to go for material like this, right? Um, and the way that I sort of think about this in particular is when something is already in a catalog and it is already in an institutional collection at an institution like Barner that is sort of a subsidiary of Columbia University to me, that material, I don't want to say it's already lost, but in a way it's already been made visible to people who are not internal to that community um, to an extent where I, I almost feel like there's not too much more damage that can be done in that way, if that makes sense. And so um, it becomes, and Jenna has said this word in conversations with me as well, it becomes almost a question of damage control of how you take this material that is present in this place and do what you can with what is there because it is there now. It's not gonna go away. Once an institution absorbs a collection like this, it's there to stay. Um, but a question of really how, how do you work with uh, what you have been given in that collection being there? Um, but yeah, it's a huge question. And I think also the approach has to vary from instance to instance and collection to collection where there are absolutely some zine collections that need to maintain their fugitivity in a way. Um, and that's also why it's important for a project like this to work with something that's already been kind of cataloged and already exists in that domain. Mm, I have a follow-up question. That I'm not allowed to ask it because it's one question per person, but if I could, it would be something around specifically space and how you would think about uh, whether creating kind of a rule, rules for what should or shouldn't be visible within, within, like in, within a collection like this, but we can't do that. So. Thank you so much. Thank you for your project. Really appreciated it. Thank gonna you. Move, gonna move on to John. Hey, John. Hey, how you doing, Amy? Really good. Um, so, you know, you know I love a, a deep dive into some kind of data set, and you delivered on that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you also for surfacing these issues around data and its accessibility, ownership control. I think a lot of these are issues that get really lost often. And we talk about these things. So I want to thank you so much for doing that and doing it so beautifully in your project in a way that opens it up to so many people. Thank you for that. What I want to ask you about is um, when, you, when you described this project, when I was reading about it beforehand, hearing you speak about it and reading uh, what's written on the DT website, you, you use this term, you talked about personal archives, or, or rather making meaningful personal archives through like, using this project as a way to create more meaningful personal archives. And you talked also about this, uh, this idea that if you can make a data set like this truly personal, then it will make it easier to think about the topic as well. And so I wanna kind of, I wonder so much, like the, the data set that you're working with, it's a data set about you, it is a personal data set, but I kind of wanna push and argue that also it's a collective data set, that it's not, you're not the only one that's, who's contained in it, that actually it contains your interactions with loads of different systems, loads of different people, but it is presented to you as individualized as is your entire sort of way, like all of our ways of accessing the web. And I wonder, do you think shifting, focusing on the collective aspect of that, would that be a way that could also make it easier for people to think about 
these kind of cold, seemingly inaccessible topics? Or are you staking your ground on approaching this from a more personal perspective? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. This project has like vacillated between being a project that is like purely about me to like something that is for other people to engage with. And I feel like it's, uh, it's like slowly working its way out. And uh, if I'm being like totally honest, like I didn't really have people truly using these tools until like this week. Um, so like I had people testing really early on with prototypes um, and that was an interesting experience. But um, now that I'm at this point where this thing is out in the world, people are starting to share what they're uncovering from these, these data sets. Um, I see that area as like a really ripe space for continuing this project um, because it's like you said, it's not just about like the queries that I'm putting in. It is how is this, like what can be exposed uh, when you combine a bunch of these data sets um, and the, and all the interactions there. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's, I, I've seen more work done uh, with Google search as a, uh, as kind of a collective data set. Um, than I have with it as this like super personalized approach. Um, and maybe I'm giving a, a, a wishy-washy answer on like, am I staking my ground? I'm glad that I, I started off with this as a purely individual approach to um, Google search data, but like I am super excited to expand this out and see how things could combine in, in all uh, a bunch of different ways. I, I feel the same way. I'm interested to see what happens and how you think about it as more and more people start to use it and as they get back to you with what they, what they discover or what they think of what it brings up. And I think that that is really, that's just, it's very powerful. You're at this end of one part of the project and I think there's, there's so much more for you to uncover. So I hope that you keep on thinking about it. And also, as I said, it's, you did it so beautifully, presented it really nicely. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. Okay, Lon. I'm gonna move on to hat comedy. Hi, Mimi. Hi, that was great. I'm so glad that you brought your um, collaborators or friends, whoever they were. Lo loved it, loved it. Also love the pun in the name, really good. Um, <laughs> and I, well actually, let me come back to that in a second. My, I thought this was, this was great. I secretly love comedy and not so secretly if I'm telling, you know, all everybody, but I really like comedy. And something I find really interesting about comedy is that as an art form, uh, it has this really wonderful aspect, much like many other art forms, in that the content that you say is um, significant, but the way that you say that is just as significant. And what's interesting about your project is that you were focusing on the text of that. And so in a way, by treating, focusing on the text, you treat that text as the sole artifact. And what we don't get is all of the everything else that goes into comedy, which, which makes it. And as someone who knows this as a lover of comedy, as a still potential stand-up comedian, you never know, <laughs> did you notice this or did you, how did you hold or grapple with that tension in your project? Um, yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think at the very beginning of like my whole research, I didn't really limit myself to only analyze the text. Um, There's a lot of images that I looked into, even video clips. But I think there's something about text. I guess it's very similar to image in a way that once you take a very specific part of content out of its original context, you know, like sometimes you can really reveal a, the bare bone um, of the themes and identities of whatever that exemplifies. And I feel like with videos and visuals, which are the stuff that we are exposed to at all time, with a lot of like the more advanced like machine learning method methods, which was some of the methods that I was exploring originally, visual pictures, videos, all of these technologies are um maybe maybe advanced is like the way to kind of put it. It's so widespreadly like widely used by everyone. Meanwhile, like I feel like with text, it's just kind of on its like um, way to becoming more and more analyzed and become more popular. Um, so that's what's something that was really, really intriguing to me. And I feel like also coming from this perspective of 
um, looking at comedy also as a, um, like a cultural, like a language, linguistic um, medium for me to explore. I think it places a very different meaning for me compared to um, a visual content. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of my way to put it. Great. Yeah, I thought some of what you're saying now is why I thought it was such a, such a good decision of you to do the performance around it because it felt to me like you were sort of stripping away some of that. As you said, you talked about getting to the bare bones. You sort of stripped it away, but then you brought it back in a totally different way that really remade it and made it your own. And I just, I very much appreciated that. I like that you didn't, you didn't stop at just the machine learning text generation. You added this other layer onto it, which I thought was a really, a really smart move, really smart move for, for this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. We cut, we have to move on. It's too, too short. Um, I think Shirley was next. Hi. Hey, Shirley, how are you doing? Very well, how are you? Good. I have kind of two questions for you that I'm gonna put into one, partly because I just, for, I didn't, I wanted to just get more information from you on the visual that you chose for this like immersive kind of 3D video that you made and why you talked a little bit about it, but I wondered if you would go a little bit deeper into that. And then the second thing, maybe you can choose, I don't know what the timing is like. Um, you had this line where you talked about how you were attempting to control your own future using technology. And I found that really interesting because you use GPT-2. And of course, that computer prediction is based on the past. And of course, it privileges everything that happened in the past. It privileges trends in the past. And it doesn't privilege any kind of changes to the future. And I found that interesting because you're talking about this um, alternative reality. So I wanted to know about your choice for that technology as a way to get you into thinking about something different into an alternative. And then as well, this just in general, more about that, the imagery that you actually chose. Yeah, of course. I think um, perhaps I'm probably going to start with the second question. So I, um, I started out this project kind of trying to understand decision-making and decision-making in the past and how I've made decisions and came to this realization that all the decisions that I've ever made around me has been influenced by the context and the society that I live in, the decisions that my family has made about my life in the past, and it goes back multiple generations. And I kind of saw this relationship between that and how GPT-2 is um, was created. And um, I had not mentioned this in my presentation, but I had actually wrote this in my thesis paper about how perhaps I can't control my uh, alternative reality. And this is just kind of the context that we live in. Um, and to, in order to accept that, it's kind of how I move forward in this space and in this idea of the multiverse. Um, and to answer your initial, your first question about the visuals that I chose, I was interested, I really wanted my visuals to feel realistic because I wanted it to look like I am actually in the multiverse. I'm in this other universe. I'm not really in this uh, unity or virtual space. Um, so I had recorded certain scenes in certain areas that are personal to my own narrative. Um, that the narrative that came out of the interview, in addition, um, kind of metaphorically reflect, reflect some of the narratives that were generated by the computer algorithms. So um, I only showed one clip uh, and the flowers and kind of like the outdoor scene was kind of how I represented happiness. And there was this beautiful line that uh, GPT-2 generated. This idea of happiness has always been a Western idea of happiness. And I wanted to kind of highlight this feeling and this emotion. Um, and uh, the other scenes kind of reflect the narratives itself. And you can view it uh, on my website, um, also on parsons.edu forward slash DT. Great. Um, the thing I would the follow-up question that I can't ask has to do with the two other people who you worked with around making this and this question of audience and you, the Asian American I think you were talking about, um, what was it exact? Oh, I, I didn't write down the exact phrase you used, but I found it really interesting. And I want to talk about how they perceive this and, but we, yeah. next well, time. We're actually watching this right now. So oh. right now, I don't know if they're on Zoom, but uh, 
I would I would love for them to kind of drop in and answer the question. But um, I had chosen these individuals because they're both Asian American women, either first or second generation. And uh, we're actually friends and we've lived very similar lives, but have chosen very different paths to go down. So mm-hmm. I kind of wanted to analyze this idea of Asian American culture being perceived as monolithic in America, but in addition to that, kind of analyze how the choices that we've made have led us down different paths. Okay, interesting. Yeah, tell them if they're here, they should (laughs) drop a little line in the chat. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. And I think last is June. Hi. Hey, June. Um, I think after all of this, I'm going to be cut off. So I'm just going to quickly say that I actually, I found some really nice, I felt like a lot of y'all's projects were in conversation with each other. (laughs) And in some ways I wish that we could, again, I wish we had more time, but I wish we were all in a room so that you could like go back and forth on one another's. But um, June, I have a question. So wonderful. So really evocative. I love this world that you created for us. I love all the thought and the depth that went into it. Um, I have a series of questions for you. (laughs) I'll only ask one or two. Um, The first one, in the same way I did with Shirley, there's sort of a a heavier one and a lighter one. The lighter one has to do with the format. You choosing specifically an audiovisual essay for this kind of topic, I find to be a really interesting intentional decision that puts us and orients us in a certain kind of way. And so I'm interested to know why you chose that format as opposed to any of the other ones that you could have used. But then the, the kind of heavier question is, that I, um, you're doing this wonderful sort of speculative work, this, I don't know if you identified as that, but you're kind of asserting, you put forth these provocations about a different kind of future, a different kind of existence. And I wonder, you are talking about this productive labor versus reproductive labor. And I, what you said made me think about um, Nandita Sharma, who's, who's a wonderful kind of thinker. And she has talked about how we get this when we're that we we find ourselves often particularly in in more like radical spaces find ourselves ending up on one or the other of a side like this we caught we get caught in these dualisms and so i wonder if you what what you think about the idea that to focus on work could be to still exist within the logics of the very capitalist exploitative system that you're critiquing that to use that as your center point did you is that not saying if i think this or not really but just what do you think about that what it's, which is really a question about what does it look like to try to imagine something different when you can only use the language of the time that you're in right now? Um, to answer your first question, um, this I started this project when I first started at Persons, and you know the early iterations were all audio visuals, um, audio visual narratives, and that format worked with with me and. Um, It was something that I was comfortable with and coming into thesis, you know, I experimented with different forms, but I kind of gave up after a while after receiving feedback because a lot of people were like, oh, there you created these like earlier iterations um, that worked really well. Um, So I kind of went back to this format and it was actually really enjoyable for me. You know, my background's in architecture, so kind of like imagining um, this world and like the space and the environment that um, it engenders like was just a very um, enjoyable part of the process. Um, and I've also uh, been informed by um, other artists who uh, who produce audiovisual um, narratives, um, people like Hiro Steiro, um, and I actually saw her um, retrospective at the AGO in Toronto in the winter. And after that, it was kind of just like, This is like what I'm going to do. To answer your second question, can, could you just clarify what you, what you mean by like the last, like the latter half of the second question? Yeah, it's, I wonder, it's kind of this age old sort of question, but whether to, it's the, the larger version of it is sort of the short thing I said at the end, which is this, the tension of trying to imagine different, different realities, different worlds when you can only use the language that emerges from the logics of the world that you exist in. And whether there's a way out of that, whether you see this as being out of that or whether you see it as being to some degree tethered to that. 
and particularly I'm saying in focusing on, on labor and focusing on work, whether you're talking about a world in which you're like, oh, what labor, all there's no productive labor, there's just reproductive labor. Does it need to be called labor in that sense? Right. What does that, what does that give it? What does that take away? I guess like with my project, it, as I said earlier, it sits kind of in the gray area between something that's reflects reality and unreality. And I decided to um, place all, like basically situate all this research that I did earlier um, in the context of a post-work society. Um, because one of, one of the earliest questions that I actually asked myself during this process was what is the future of reproductive labor in an increasingly automated society that questions the meaning of work itself? And while, um, while I did not get that far to kind of like redefine what work actually means. Um, to me, like, you know, I wasn't writing like a PhD dissertation. I was trying to make an MFA thesis. And um, I guess it's like the time constraints, but also I want to kind of focus on um, how to make this work visible in the context of things that are currently happening, but also um, kind of situating it in like a distant future. Yeah, to be clear, I think it worked. I think you did it right. <laughs> but I'm interested in your thinking going into it. Yeah, it, wonderful. Thank you. Does that, did that answer your question? Sorry. Of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. I think I think that's all. Right, Allison? Yeah. We're, we've gone way over. We're um, good. No. Thanks so much. Thanks, y'all. That was really, really, really wonderful. And your projects, as I said, are so polished. And I just so appreciated seeing them. Thank you. Thanks so, so much, Mimi, for just your these amazing, critical, and insightful questions that you're able to, to ask everyone. Um, I'm sure it was more than appreciated from all the all the speakers tonight.